Um, because these are really hefty labs, I'm going to go ahead and get started and then we'll have um, open questions and review of last week um, at the end. Okay. So let me go ahead and minimize. There we go. Okay, so as usual, the weekly study tip. Um, so for this uh, one, it's not so much a study tip as far as how to study, but it's more of a time management tip. Um, schedule in regular study time, and then when it comes uh, to an exam week, you can give yourself extra study time the week coming up to the exam. So ideas for this would be taking a day off from work or having a reduced schedule. So if you normally work 25 hours, maybe you request that you work 20 hours on that week before the exam. And also another tip would be writing down these exam and quiz dates on a calendar or posting them on the fridge somewhere where your friends and family or uh, roommates, whoever, will know like not to bother you during this uh, preparation week where you're doing extra studying. Um, and also just want to clarify that study time is in addition to the time it takes you to complete your homework. So your initial, you know, watching your lecture, completing assignments, um, coming here and, and getting these introductions and completing the labs, that's just all homework. That's expected, uh, right? You know, the study time is going to be in addition to that. Okay, and then just a reminder, we are almost done. We, we have uh, four weeks left of new, you know, content. And then that fifth week is just finals week. So four more weeks to, you know, buckle down and really um, get all the points you possibly can study harder and finish strong. Okay, so viral gene therapy lobster is, um, focusing on using viral gene therapy to help patients that have heart disease. So what is viral gene therapy? Well, it's using a virus to deliver a functional gene to cells that don't have a functional gene. So usually this is a mutated gene that is important and without it is causing um, uh, some disease. And so if we can replace uh, or give those cells a copy of the functional gene, then you can either eliminate the disease or at least ease uh, some of the symptoms. And so this is uh, for genetic diseases, of course. Um, and so this is actually really neat because you get to see the intersection. Usually when we are dealing with microbiology, we're dealing with infectious diseases and we don't really tackle genetic diseases, but now we're able to utilize microbes and learn how they do things and, and then take that and manipulate it for our own purposes. And that hopefully this, I sound like a broken record by now, because I've said this a lot, where we, we take a model, we learn how it's done in bacteria or viruses, et cetera, and then we do that for our own purposes. So this is another example of that. Okay, so we're going to use a virus to deliver a functional gene into cells of the heart to help treat heart disease. And we're going to, of course, we don't practice on people, right? So we're going to use mice as a model and we will compare the fitness uh, of these mice. Um, and we will see mice that have been induced to have heart disease. And then we will see mice where a particular gene called the circa 2A gene has been knocked out. So there's probably two questions you have. Well, what is this circa gene? Why are we knocking it out? And why are we comparing fitness? Well, one of the symptoms of heart disease is the inability to exercise. Um, heart disease can, a loose definition can be, um, the inability of the heart to pump enough blood um, to keep up with the body's demand. And so, of course, uh, the more you exert yourself, the more your demand for, um, for blood circulation increases. And so uh, someone with 
heart disease would not be able to meet those increasing demands. So comparing these um, mice, we can see uh, what is the phenotype of mice with heart disease. And we expect they will not be able to perform heavy exertion, right? Just like um, in humans, we, we cannot do heavy exertion if we have heart disease. Um, and then whatever the phenotype we observe with these uh, heart disease mice, uh, is that what we see when we look at the knockout mouse? Now we've talked about knocking out genes already in previous labs. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about that, but what I will do is explain more about the circuit 2 a gene and why we would have a knockout mouse for that. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Okay, so that's your first experiment in this labster is comparing the fitness of the knockout mouse to the heart disease mouse. And the reason for this is to see, do they have the same phenotype? And if they do have the same phenotype, then that would indicate that the circa 2A gene is a good gene target um, for viral gene therapy, okay? And then you'll do some more things. And at the very end of the lab, you will uh, treat the mouse with heart disease to see if your viral gene therapy works. So what's in between is the making the viral gene therapy um, creating a virus vector to carry that human gene. And so the rest of these slides, we will focus on that. And just as a little aside, you will also get to see, visualize these um, recombinant viruses, the viruses that we make for um, gene therapy. We'll visualize them um, briefly with the uh, TEM that you've already learned about in the past as well. Okay. So what is this circa 2A gene and why do we suspect it's a good target? Well, we are, are studying heart disease. Uh, we're trying to treat heart disease, right? And so just a little brief reminder about the cardiac cycle. Systole is when the heart contracts to pump blood out and diastole is when it relaxes and that allows it to refill with blood. And so a, a complete cycle is going to consist of contraction and relaxation. You need to have both for the heart to function, okay? And so what we, as I mentioned before, we've seen patients with heart failure have inadequate ability of the heart to pump blood, enough blood, right? You can't keep up with the body's demand. And so then thinking about all of these concepts together, um, also want to point out, uh, remind you that calcium is required in order to have a muscle contraction. And this part's going to possibly seem a little confusing, but bear with me. So I said a cardiac cycle needs to have both contraction and relaxation. And now we're talking, reminding you that calcium is required for that contraction to happen. But equally important, the calcium must be removed for the contraction to stop and to allow the heart muscle to relax. So we are going to be looking at this circa 2A gene as a possible target for therapy because the circa pump is in, it's within the a membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And recall that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is where calcium is stored. And when an action potential comes into the muscle cell, it's gonna trigger uh, lots of calcium to be released into the cytosol that will cause your contraction. And then immediately the uh, pumps, the circuit pumps, pump the calcium back from the cytosol back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you don't pump the calcium back into the SR, then you will not, you will be stuck with a contraction. Okay. Um, and obviously that's, we can't have that. The heart needs to be able to complete um, and repeat these cycles. So when we do a circa 2A knockout mouse, 
we will get to observe how important is the circa 2a gene in um in the function of the heart um so the circa 2a gene codes for these circa pumps they're not the only pumps um it's the circa 2a gene is encoding one of these pumps right if if it was the only pump then the mouse would die you wouldn't be able to have a knockout mouse okay all right so any questions so far So a little uh, visual with what I was just saying about the circa pump. So um, it's the only pump shown in this um, image, but just remember it's not the only pump that there is. Okay, so the circa 2A calcium ATPase pump takes the calcium from the cytosol and pumps it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then of course, at the next action potential, it'll trigger that calcium to be released from the SR into the cytoplasm and that will trigger a contraction. And then the circa 2A pump will pump it back in and that will allow the muscle to relax. And so it's this cycle over and over again. Okay, you will see different terms used throughout the simulation. So just a reminder, myocyte is uh, referring to a muscle cell cardiomyocyte then would refer specifically to heart muscle cells. Okay, so sometimes they'll, they'll say heart muscle, sometimes they'll say um, myocardium. They're just going to use all the different terms. Uh, so just beware and be ready for that. You get to flex your vocabulary muscles. Okay, so now that we have decided to use the Circa 2A as a uh, a target for this gene therapy, we need to then assemble our viral vector for the therapy. So um, one of the viruses that can be used as a vector is called AAV, and this stands for adeno-associated virus. So there are adenoviruses, they're very common, and depending on where they infect, which tissue they infect, that can cause different um, diseases. But uh, the adeno-associated virus doesn't actually cause any disease. It can infect humans, but it won't make you sick. It won't cause any um, harm. Um, it's a small virus. It consists of single-stranded DNA, and it has the icosahedral shape, which if you uh, have forgotten, uh, just means that it has 20 sides. And so this is... Obviously, this top part is a um, animation or cartoon of the virus, but down here in the bottom is an actual electron micrograph, so an actual image of uh, what these viruses look like, and so you can see they have that, that same shape. Okay, now they are small, and their genome, the, their normal genome size is about 4.8 uh, kilobases long. And so when you select this as a vector, you that's your limit. You cannot put more genetic material than that. Um, and so you, uh, whenever you're making a viral vector, you would always need to make sure you, you're selecting an appropriate uh, virus um, based on different characteristics such as the size. So if the gene that you want to um, have as your uh, therapeutic gene is bigger than the virus's uh, genome, you would need to pick a different virus. For us, this uh, is appropriate. Our, um, our therapeutic gene of interest, the circa 2A gene, is not um, too large. And so this is what we're going to work with. We are also going to replace the entire viral genome with only what we need and want um, and it's very specific, okay? Um, and GOI is an abbreviation for gene of interest, and you're going to see that a lot today, okay? So GOI means gene of interest. Write it down because it's easy when you go back and look at things, um, and, you know, in a day or two to forget. So GOI, gene of interest, okay? Um, so how does this virus get into cells and cause infection. 
So the virus will bind. There's a, a protein on the capsid of the virus and it will bind to a receptor on the membrane of the cell that it's going to infect. And that binding is going to induce endocytosis. And so then the, um, the cell envelope is going to right, kind of engulf, bring within the uh, virus. And that's going to form an endosome, right? And then from there, you'll get the lysosome um, that will uh, fuse with the endosome. And then the virus is actually able to escape. And we're not going to go into the details of how that works. I know you're familiar with endosomes and lysosomes um, and the specifics of how the virus is able to escape is, is not the point of this, um, of this lab. Okay, so that's as much detail as um, you need to know. Then now that it escapes, it's able to um, un unravel and uh, protein synthesis will occur in the cytosol. The uh, virus will also go into the nucleus and DNA replication will happen there. And then the assembly will also happen in, within the nucleus. And um, there's no risk of infection when we're doing this method because we are replacing the genome. And also the fact that this virus doesn't usually cause any disease anyway, but we're removing all of the genes and we're putting in what we want. So we're not worried about infection from, from this viral vector. But one thing we do need to watch out for is if the patient already has antibodies to AAV, because AAV does exist in nature, it is possible that the patient could have already been exposed to it and, and made antibodies. And if they have antibodies, then the ability of the virus to, to do what we want it to do, to act as a vector, is going to be reduced. And it, and it might not be um, a usable uh, method anymore. Also, once we administer this therapy, we have to also look out for if the patient develops antibodies after their first treatment. Um, this is not a permanent fix. We're not embedding, uh, we're not inserting this uh, therapeutic gene into the cell's chromosomes. So it's temporary. When the cell divides, it will not replicate the therapeutic gene. It won't be passed on. So eventually patients will need to have this uh, treatment again. And um, so we have to constantly look out for and be concerned about um, antibodies um, in the patient. Okay, so uh, otherwise, you know, it's completely uh, safe. It's just how effective will it be? If they have antibodies, it's not likely to be very effective. All right. So what will the vector have? We've removed all of the viral genetic material and we're going to replace it with three specific plasmids. The plasmid with our gene of interest, the circa 2A plasmid. Then we have the viral um, plasmid that's needed for the virus to be able to replicate and make the capsid protein. So in order to make new viruses, they need these two particular genes. So this viral plasmid is going to have the rep and the cap. So rep and cap genes, uh, replication and capsid. And then we have a third, which is called a helper plasmid. Um, and all you need to know for, uh, for this is that it helps assist the uh, replication and assembly of viruses. Um, and that is it. This is what we're going to use to make the uh, adeno-associated virus vector. Um, but something else that is really important that I wanna to talk to you about is that when we're finished and we have our, our recombinant, our new, 
uh, vector that we will administer, that vector will not contain these two plasmids. So these two plasmids are only being used in this intermediate step to build up and make a whole bunch of recombinant um, viruses. And those recombinant viruses will only contain the circa 2A plasmid. And I have that written on the next slide. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, for what we call co-transfection is uh, we want to insert these vectors into a cell. And you know from our horizontal gene transfer lab that there are multiple ways to get genetic material into a cell. Um, but we're not working with bacteria, so we're not going to use conjugation. Um, and we're not going to use uh, electroporation this time because it's, it's um, pretty harsh. And we want to use uh, human cells and we want to keep those cells uh, healthy. Um, and so we're actually going to use a transfection reagent, which is a lipid uh, reagent to a more gen gentle approach to get these um, plasmids into our cell tissue culture, human cell line um, in our tissue culture. And so let's take a look at that. We will come back to what I was talking about in a moment. Okay, so the, how do we get these three plasmids, right? The circa and the two viral plasmids. How do we get those into our human cell line? The HEK293 human cell line for cell culture. So first we're going to put the DNA, the plasmids together with the transfection reagent we're going to let those incubate for about 20 minutes. And what's happening during that 20 minutes is the negative charge on the DNA is attracted to the positive charge, which you'll see here um, on this uh, lipid. So this uh, is the transfectionary agent, okay? And so the DNA and the transfectionary agent are going to form this complex, which you see here. And that can then, once you introduce that to the cells, um, which are shown here, a uh, cell membrane in purple, once you introduce the complex to cells, then they can um, enter the cell um, through endocytosis. Okay. So the first thing you do is you put the three plasmids together with the transfection reagent and you let that sit for about 20 minutes because you want all of these complexes to form. Then you will um, give this uh, complex to your cell culture um, plate and um, you'll incubate that for 48 hours. So now we need to talk about what's happening inside of these tissue cells, culture, tissue culture cells. Okay, so this is what's happening. The complex, the DNA with the lipid, the complex is uh, going to go into the cells through endocytosis. Okay, and then that's going to allow those plasmids to be in the cell. It's gonna go deliver them into the nucleus. And what's interesting is that the, the viral plasmids that we introduced are, they're only going to be utilized to make new viruses, but they will not be packaged in these new viruses. Only the circa 2A gene is going to have the signal on it to get packaged into the new viruses. Um, and so these new viruses are called recombinant viruses. Remember, anytime you change the wild type genetic content, uh, whether that's adding or removing a gene, or in this case, we've completely removed all the content and we're only putting and in the circa 2A gene, okay? So that's the recombinant AAV, uh, which is abbreviated RAAV, right? Um, and it only has the circa 2A gene. 
And so again, that's because uh, we included these signals only for the circa 2A gene. So right before and right after the circa 2A gene on the plasmid, there's the signal that uh, allows it to be uh, packaged inside the capsid of these newly forming viruses. Uh, if, you, if you were to put that signal on the other plasmids, then they would all be packaged, but we don't want that. We want to have just the circa 2A gene. Um, and so this, you really wanna take a note, there's no viral DNA in the recombinant uh, adeno-associated virus that we've made, okay? So now that you have let those cells incubate for 48 hours, you have lots and lots and lots of recombinant virus with only the therapeutic gene. And now we can harvest or take those, purify those from the cells. Uh, and then, then you're ready to deliver the viral gene therapy. And for this, um, for the treatment of, of the heart disease, uh, we are specifically delivering through the coronary artery. Remember the coronary artery is what gives blood to the heart itself. Um, and so it's called an intracoronary infusion. Um, you don't actually see that procedure done. It's done, the simulation does it for you. And then um, the other uh, neat thing is that not only did we make sure only the circa 2A gene was packaged in these recombinant viruses, but we also have made sure that there's a specific promoter that only cardiomyocytes are able to use. So even if our therapeutic gene gets delivered to some neighboring cells, for example, um, something that's not the target, it won't matter because they other cells won't be able to utilize. Uh, they won't be able to transcribe the circa 2A gene because the promoter is specific to cardiomyocytes. So remember when we learned about transcription factors a few labs ago um, in the protein synthesis lobster, um, only not every cell makes all transcription factors. You have some general and then you have cell specific, right? So we're taking advantage of a cell cardiomyocyte cell specific promoter. All right. And so the next, the therapeutic gene is, has been delivered to the mice uh, through intracoronary infusion. You wait about five weeks and then you can run some tests. So uh, what happened when this was delivered? As I mentioned, um, it will deliver, so the virus, the recombinant virus that we made that only has the therapeutic gene is going to deliver that gene into the cells where it can then be utilized, okay? So the therapeutic gene resides in the nucleus and remains separate from the cell's genome. You are not integrating this into chromosomes. Okay, it is separate. So when the cell divides, the therapeutic gene is, is not replicated and, and so we say it's lost. Um, this is why eventually patients will need to have this therapy repeated. Um, and so that is something that you will be discussing in our post lab um, questions. Okay, and so then now you're coming to the end of the lobster simulation where you've waited the five weeks and you're finally ready to test the um, efficiency or effectiveness of your viral gene therapy. So just like you started in the beginning, you're going to do a fitness test to compare phenotypes. This time you'll have a um, couple of different controls. So as usual, make sure you're taking note for each experiment um, what's the setup and what are the controls? What were the results? How did you interpret the results, right? So for this one, you're going to compare the phenotypes of a healthy mouse to the phenotype of your uh, heart disease mouse and then compare that to our uh, treated mouse, 
our viral gene therapy mouse, okay? Um, and we wanna see how the phenotypes compare. So uh, did the gene therapy allow the mouse to become more fit, to be able to tolerate more exercise? And then uh, we wanna look a little bit more specifically at the function of the heart. And so we're going to look at ejection fraction. And if you took physiology, you, you know all of this already, but it, just in case, if you don't know, um, when you look at the amount of blood that's being pumped out of the heart and you compare that to the total amount that was in the ventricle before the pumping, you can get this uh, percentage. And a normal fraction, uh, ejection fraction is 50 to 75%. Furthermore, you're going to compare ejection fractions of healthy mice, heart disease mice, and uh, our viral gene therapy mouse. And so with both the fitness test and the ejection fraction test, you'll be able to determine if our uh, gene therapy worked. And so um, pretty fun lab, pretty neat. Uh, so as you are going through this simulation, you wanna keep in mind the post lab questions um, so you can take extra notes on these. Um, so you'll want to be able to tell me what is gene therapy and how, uh, what is viral gene therapy, right? So viral gene therapy is only, uh, is a specific, uh, method of delivering gene therapy, but there are others, right? So distinguish between the gene therapy in general and viral gene therapy specifically. Then uh, tell me what AAV stands for and what recombinant AAV means. What is that? Um, what were the plasmids that we used to make our um, recombinant virus? And then explain if there are any risks of viral infection uh, to the patient, why or why not? And uh, why did we need to use cell culture of what happened during that incubation period. And then um, how does the doctor ad administer the actual uh, gene, viral gene therapy to the patient? Um, and how is the virus getting inside the cells to deliver the, uh, the therapeutic gene? Um, how, how do we avoid circa expression in non-heart cells? How do we make sure that we are specifically targeting uh, the heart muscle cells. And then um, will offspring of mice receive the therapeutic gene? Why or why not? Um, is the patient or mouse going to be cured forever from the genetic disease? Why or why not? And then lastly, what are risks involved in viral gene therapy? And really risk should really say complication. So if you would please make a note of that. Um, when I say what are potential risks with this uh, viral gene therapy method, um, you can discuss possible complications. Okay. All right, does anyone have any questions about the viral gene therapy lab that I just introduced to you? Let me go ahead and check our chat just to see if anyone has by chance um, typed anything in the chat? No. Okay. So don't see any questions. I don't have anything in the chat. Does anyone want to talk about anything before I move on? Okay. All right. So next, 